So what we're going to do today is I have about an hour and a half with you and I'm, my degree is in education. I recognize that I am, um, I am dumping information on you today and I'm running out the door, literally, to, to catch the ferry because I want to go see the Statue of Liberty. But anyway, <laughs> when am I ever going to get a chance to do that again? I don't know. <laughs> so anyway. Um, well, there's a couple of things I'd like to, to I'm going to try to turn you on to a couple of tips about how human beings assimilate information, when do they grab onto it and do something with it, and how do, how do you, when you have to dump and run, because you're only going to get your residents, when you, when you pull your community together and they're going to learn about preparedness and you're going to encourage them to be self-sufficient when disasters happen, you're probably going to get your audience for maybe 45 minutes. That, I mean, reality check. Um, if you think uh, that's, there are programs that are days long, but really their attention span is maybe 45 minutes on this topic, maybe a year, once a year. So you have to give them information in a way in which they'll remember it. And the best way to do that is through kinesthetic learning. Kinesthetic learning means you see it, you hear it, you say it, you do it. You engage as much of your physical body with the information as you can. So one of the things I'd like for you to do today, and writing notes is one of the kinesthetic learnings, but I'd like for you to put a light bulb on a piece of paper. Draw, take a piece of paper out, draw a light bulb on it. And if you really want to be creative and remember it, draw it with your opposite hand. Because the more you work with your opposite hand, the more you'll remember it. That's even harder. I, I can't even brush my hair with my left hand. I'm so bad with that. But draw a light bulb, and that is going to be your bright ideas page. I'm going to give you a lot of information today. And some of this information is going to stick. It's going gonna, it's gonna to say, I got that or that makes sense for me, or that makes sense for my community. I'm going to talk about being prepared to be self-sufficient for an extended length of time. How many of you are here are prepared to be on your own? I don't like on your own, by the way. That's terminology I don't use. I like self-sufficient. That's far more empowering than being on your own. Um, so you, as an individual, with you and your staff, along with your community, need to be self-sufficient for at least seven to ten days. So I'm going to give some tips for that today. And if you haven't started your journey to being self-sufficient for the next Hurricane Sandy, there'll be some stuff you're going to hear. You're going to go, I never thought of that. I could store water in two liter pot bottles. What a great idea. It doesn't cost me a whole lot. I could put things in a suitcase on wheels and have it be a grab and go bag. That's so much easier than a backpack and I'll probably remember it. You might have family members who need medication in order to be healthy and safe. Like when my dad was um, really sick, I worked with his doctor and pharmacy to get medication. So there'll be tips in there. And I want you to write those down, personal tips, tips for how you engage your community because that's part of the kinesthetic learning. And unless I get to come back out here on a regular basis, I'm dumping and running. I get you about 90 minutes and that's it. So it's the best I can do for you. So my goals today is I'd like to understand, I'd like to help you understand what does preparedness mean? And you know, in some communities, Preparedness is not even a word that translates into their language. So we need to understand how the terminology preparedness, what does it really mean so we can translate it and educate our community leaders so they can help us um, share the message. There are truly barriers to, to preparing. And um, they're kind of inherent in us as human beings. And I want to talk about those so you can work around those barriers once you're working with your community. Um, I think that one of the challenges and disservices we've done as a country is we've created unrealistic expectations, especially in disaster response. So I'm going to talk a little bit about expectations. How do you keep those expectations real? And how do you overcome when they already think that the expect, I mean, the disaster happens and, well, it's been three days. You told me three days. What are those expectations? How do you overcome those? I'll try, I'll try that. That's a really tough one. I believe in consequence-based planning, so we'll talk a little bit about that versus hazard planning, consequence-based planning, so I'll explain what that is when I get to it. And I like to keep things as simple as I can, especially if I'm working with an audience that I'm only going to get for a very short period of time. The steps that you need to give people have got to be so simple that once they, once they leave the room, they will remember them very, very quickly under duress. Because remember, the stuff that they're, you're asking them to do, they're more likely going to be doing it under a set of adrenaline rush or under fear or under anxiety because you've told them a hurricane is coming, there's a terrorist event that we anticipate 
dissipate. There is, um, um, we have a threat of earthquake. Um, there, all of those things, those are not things we want to talk about. So that you're always going to be under duress. And then I have some ideas that we've used in Seattle that I hope can translate here too. There is no preparedness pill. I wish I could say that. And I have really cool animation on this slide and it's not working right now. If it were working, then up would pop a wand and say there's no preparedness wand that you can wave over somebody. You're visualizing with me here? And then that would dissolve out and then would come up a witch and say there's no preparedness spell. I worked really hard on the animation. It's just not working. <laughs> and then it would actually say there's no preparedness pill there, but it didn't. In other words, I, there is no one way to do this. And there's no one way that you can get people to take your information and apply it. It's going to take a buffet. And that's what I'm, I'm a foodie. I love to cook. And as you can maybe see a little bit, I love to eat. And <laughs> I've had a great time in New York. You guys have some fabulous food. Um, but people will come to the information about getting ready for something they don't want to have happen. They'll do that on their own time frame. They'll do it when it hits them personally. They'll do it when they're hungry for the information. And that will be at different times. So you need to be able to capture that teachable moment, as I said earlier. And you need to be prepared, you as an organization, need to be prepared to give the information out in a variety of ways in which they're ready to eat it. It might not eat it, absorb it, let's put it that way. I might, you might have a community member who's not ready to talk about putting together disaster supplies, but they are ready to talk about planning. So having the information about planning available is just as important as information about supplies. Does that make sense? Nods? Yes, good. So here's a little bit of the challenges, the barriers. Um, let's face it, how many of you get up in the morning and go, wow, what a beautiful day. I really want to talk about disasters. <laughs> Only us in emergency management do that. And we do it every day. That's kind of a unique breed that we do that. Um, it's not something people want to talk about. As a matter of fact, in a lot of our cultures, if you talk about the disaster, you are wishing it upon yourself. And that's one of the reasons I really truly believe when we're working with our immigrant refugee community that we have to harness our community leaders to help us. Because we don't always translate the information in a way in which they will absorb it and use it. And we are not the trusted sources in many cases. I'm sorry, I hit the microphone there. We are not the trusted sources. I work for Seattle Police Department. We are not the trusted sources. So you have to find your community leaders that are the trusted sources to help you deliver this information when you're ready to build community and start teaching. I think it's also important to understand it's just in human nature, inherent in all of us, there are some denial phases because we don't want to think about this stuff. The four phases of denial, uh, it's not going to happen, phase one. And they're not necessarily progressive, but second phase of denial, yeah, it's going to happen, but it won't happen here. I'm from New York. I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm from California. That's a really one I hear over on the other side. It's not going to happen here. That's an Alaska thing. That happens in Japan. That happens in Australia. That happens in London. That happens in Washington, D.C. Hurricanes, that's a Florida thing. So it happens everywhere else, but it hasn't happened here. Third phase of denial, yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to happen here, but it won't be that bad. Come on. I am from New York. I've been through every disaster known to mankind, either in real life or Hollywood or on television, right? And besides, the government's going to be here to help, right? <laughs> Talk about that too. Fourth phase of denial, yeah, it's going to happen. It's going to be so bad, we're all going to die anyway, so why should I prepare? The fatalistic viewpoint. And when you start talking about things that are as catastrophic, and we're actually introducing the term catastrophic into the public education messages, because people have gotten a little bit... Um, we did some research in a, in a um, campaign that I just recently managed. That, that's what we won the uh, national awards on. And we figured we used focus groups to help us incorporate the terminology catastrophe into our message. And we let the community groups that we did the focus groups with help us define that. And we found that there are three big barriers. Well, they found, we found that uh, people are kind of feeling it's the new attitude on the next bullet there. That if it's only three days worth of preparedness, I can get by. And people equate now three-day preparedness, 72-hour preparedness with disaster, and disasters aren't that bad. 
I can get by. So they're not necessarily taking action to prepare. But once you engage the term cat catastrophe and we let them define that, then they said, yeah, catastrophes can happen. We've seen them happen. We've seen them now happen all over the world as well as in our own country. And that means I need to be prepared for longer and they're willing to take a longer step. So adding that catastrophe, if your, group, if your community hasn't even talked about any of it, it might be hard to assimilate catastrophe into the, the terminology, but people are prepared. You've had a, an experience now. Was everything back to normal in three days? Is everything back to normal yet? No, it isn't. There's a new normal after a catastrophic event. And that's another terminology I like to use with audiences because you never are whole again when you have a big event like this. You never are. So there's a, but you do come back to a new normal. And, it's a, and, and in many cases, especially if you've organized with your community and you're well prepared, you come back to a new normal that's stronger than before if you work through it. So the three big barriers, when you're working with your community and you start talking about let's get prepared for at least seven to ten days, your big barriers people are going to throw up at you, I don't have time for that. What are you talking about? I don't have time to do this. Second, second barrier, I don't have money. I just don't have enough money to do this. It's too expensive. And the third one is, you, I don't know where to start. So those are your three big barriers. I don't have time. I don't have money. I don't know where to start. So if you understand those three barriers at the beginning, before you pull your community together and you start talking about how do you work together to work through these catastrophic events that can happen, understand the barriers in advance. If I don't have time, because I'm working three jobs to put food on the table, then your program can only meet probably once a year, maybe. Little reminders here and there and 45 minutes is top. If I don't have enough money, don't expect, 70, or don't expect 7 to 10 days worth of food. If you run out of food, that's a disaster. You take the can out of your disaster supplies kit and you use it. And you just be resourceful for what you have available to work with. And I think when it comes to managing expectations, um, I've, I've worked in the fire service as an educator. And I've worked now in the police department as an educator. And I think that um, we have as uh, Craig Fugate, director of FEMA, put it um, at the award ceremony, our professional responders have for years said, just back away, we'll take care of this. And when it comes to catastrophic and disaster events, we need to say, come on in and let us help. And it's hard to go through that transition. It's hard for, it's hard for uh, professional responders to say, come on in and help. It's not in their training. It's not in their, their mix. They're, they're the ones that they take over. They do. So managing those expectations, making sure people understand when a disaster happens and it happens in the evening or a catastrophic event happens in the evening, you have less staff. If you have less staff, then they need to be even more resourceful and more helpful. To, that the first responders are professional responders. That's, this is another term I'm working through and as you can tell I'm even working through it in my brain a little bit. I believe that our police, fire, transportation, public works, parks, authorities, all of those are professional responders. But the true first responder are you. You're the one that makes the call to 911. You're the ones that are doing CPR. You're the ones that are helping your neighbors. You're the ones that are checking on each other. You are the first responders. And then our fire, law enforcement, public works, transportation, we're all professional responders. So I think, and what I like about that also is that it's a, it's a true empowerment. If I told you you are the first, you're first on scene, then oftentimes that's when I get people saying, well then give me some training. If I'm going to be first on scene, give me the training to help with that. And I see that shift, that, that shift in proaction. Um, They're on their way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> So there's not enough professional responders to go around for the people in need. I mean, if you were to look at the population here versus the number of professional responders that are available, there's just not enough to go around. They will be working hard and then the professional responders, our mission is to do the most good for the most people in the shortest amount of time. So after a major catastrophic event like Superstorm Sandy, you're going to find more resources going towards infrastructure than people. 
because that does the most good for the most people in the shortest amount of time. If that makes sense? We need to get our power grid back up. We need to get our water pumped out of our, our transportation systems. We need to take care of the big stuff so that that impacts the most people and then we start getting down to more detail. Thank you. And, and talk with your staff about what is the realistic, or your, your community. When you don't have staff, what are the actions you want them to take around? When, when you do have staff. I mean, some of you have staff that are, that are spread beyond, be, between multiple buildings. So your plan, explain your plan and how it works, because I know you're all developing your own disaster plan for your organizations. It's important for them to understand what the plan is, so that they can see where does their role have and where do they fit into the overall plan? And, and that helps the foundation. And funding is very limited, and we know that. And there's a danger. I put this sign up, and, and if my animation was working, it would be spinning into, spin. I worked so hard on the animation, I just have to explain it to you. <laughs> it spins into place like, danger, danger, warning, warning, expectations. People have expectations based on things you have no control over. For example, how do people really understand and learn about earthquakes here in New York? If you don't give them information, where are they going to get their information from? Hollywood. Our big problem. Every time a new movie comes out on earthquake, earthquake is our biggest threat. Every time a movie comes out about earthquakes, I cringe. Because I'm going to have to go re-educate my entire community. Because they take Hollywood at face value. So expectations, they can be a blessing and a curse. So I'd like for you to take a moment, uh, disaster, disaster preparedness, community organizing, it's all about relationships. It's, it is truly, and it's one of the hardest things that we do. I mean, I, I joke with people when I go out and teach neighborhoods, because um, we, we go out, people will call us and they'll gather their neighbors together and we go out and we teach a program on site. And the welcome wagon doesn't show up anymore. <laughs> you know, it, you, in, in the old days, you know, you drive in with a truck and everybody comes out on the street and they help you move in and they bring over casseroles and it doesn't happen. It hasn't happened for a long time. So what I'd like for you to do is to start building relationships. You know some people here. Would you please stand up very quickly? Stand up, if you can. Stand up. Move to at least two people you haven't met yet. Get in a small group, just a stand-up group, somebody with a pen and paper. It's all about relationships. Got it? All right, now. Okay, have you got your group? You've got your clan? Okay, in your clan there, I want one of your writers. This is speed writing. This is speed ideas. So I want you to write things down as quickly as you can. You're going to toss ideas out to them. Your first question, and then, I'll, and then I'll, and I'll say start and then stop, and then we'll do the second one. What are your organizational expectations of government, professional responders, social service agents, and catastrophic and disaster. What are your expectations? So if your expectation is be there, that's what I want you to write down. Uh, good information. I want you to do those kind of quick sound bites. And you're going to have 30 seconds to get as many down as you can. Are you ready? Go. <laughs> What do you expect of your residents and tenants? Ready? Go. Cooperation. <laughs> <laughs> 
What are your organizational expectations of government? Hey. Nothing? There's blank? <laughs> Pardon? Information. Info. And repetition. Over and over and over. Over and over. Over and over. Over and over. Can I add one thing to that? Consistent. Because doesn't it bug you when you get information and then 30 seconds later you get a different set of expectations? Yeah, yeah. Okay, what else? Information. Directions. Pardon? Okay. Funding money. I'll take one more. Okay. What are you, what are your expectations of residents, community members? Uh huh. Communicate. Okay. Helping. Okay. So I have cooperation, stay calm, communicate, help each other, listen, and be proactive. Now, what do you think your residents expect of you? Handle Leadership. Materials, no miracles. I can't even spell. I can't. It's so poorly spelled. I don't even know what it is. Miracles, handle it. Everything. Financial. Money. Receiver of venting. Pardon? Someone to scream at. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if you're a ventor, then you're a ventee. Is that right? So the one that receives it. Okay. Anything else? All right. You know, I look at this, although it's kind of a mess on the page, it feels pretty heavy. What you asked for is not near as heavy as what you put on your shoulders. And what you ask of your community members is not near as heavy as what they're putting on your shoulders. There's some big gaps there. Yes. Inhale. Yeah. Exhale. It was very interesting from this perspective, you all got about three inches shorter. <laughs> Stand up, because there are ways in which we can bridge the gap. Pollyanna in the movie, doesn't matter what happened to her, she was just so positive all the time. The Pollyanna attitude, I really believe the best in people. And I know sometimes I get slapped around a little bit, and, then, and I, but you have to get back on the Pollyanna pony. Because it's really one of those, for me, it's really important. People will do what they perceive as the right thing, given lack of training and information. And I'll say it again in another slide, but I wanted to drop that on you now. I'm going to say it another time. People will do what they perceive is the right thing, given lack of training and information. So how can we bridge the gap? Most importantly, communicate. What are the expectations? Let them know where the gaps are. How can they help with that? Coordinating people together, building these relationships, just giving a pop, a, an opportunity for people to meet each other and talk very briefly about, about what to do makes a huge difference. 
Collaborating not just with your community members, but with buildings around you and building partnerships. Um, maybe not just even with the buildings immediately around you because you may be in a flood zone where another housing building is in, not in a flood zone. So collaboration, collaboration outside of hazard areas too, potentially. People will do what they perceive as the right thing given lack of training. Education and training in the way in which they will receive it best is so very important. And then support. I know that you are sounding blocks sometimes for people that only bring you just absolutely demanding stuff every single day. But that support, sometimes you can't, I, I know in, in working with some of my communities, it's really hard to talk about building this collaborative, positive thing when the bus route is just getting canceled outside their door. So sometimes being the connector between the challenges they are right and faced in front of in order to survive, being the connector with how they might be able to solve that opens the door for you being able to help them for disaster preparedness. Um, so the support and then celebration. I am a big, big proponent about celebrating. I don't care if it's the smallest little thing, you do a Snoopy happy dance. And you do it on a regular basis because people love to celebrate. Even the grumpiest people in your building love to celebrate. You, isn't it funny how when I say the grumpiest people, a face flashed right before your eyes, didn't it? It did. It happens that way. I used to teach school. I used to teach middle school. I often say that nothing got me better prepared for disaster management than teaching middle school. And, it's, and there are grumpy people out there. So my, my point here. People will live up or down to your expectations depending on what they are. And that's because when our expectations are low, we provide very little information to change that. And when your expectations are high, you provide more. That's human and that's just, that's just part of us. So people will live up or down to your expectations. Expect a lot of people. And you'll be providing them with stuff that will help them be successful. And people will do what they perceive as the right thing given lack of training. Most people have a lot of other things on their mind. Yes? Can I ask you to talk about the phrase, given the lack of training? Yes. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. So, um, I'll give you an example from the fire service. There was a major fire. Um, it actually, um, <coughs> excuse me, it was a, a devastating fire. There, was a fa there were fatalities in it. There was a woman who was rescued from it. And the fire inspector went to her in the hospital and asked her why she did the actions that she did. Because what she did is she went and she hid in a closet and they found her scratching at the sheetrock on the wall. And so everybody thought that she had panicked. But what she was doing when she told the story was she had learned when she was a child that the more doors you have between you and the fire, the more likely you're going to survive. And so what she was doing, given lack of any other training, was putting doors between her. And when she finally, she saw a door to get into a room, she saw a door to get into a closet. And then she remembered that on the other side of that room was a fire escape. And so she was actually trying to get herself to the fire escape. But everybody perceived something different. So given lack of training, she didn't remember that the fire escape was on that side until later. If she had known and had the training to take that step first, she would have been in the room and given out. So if people don't, if people rely on Hollywood for their information, you know the safest thing to do in an earthquake is drop cover and hold. You all know that, right? Okay, the safest thing to do in an earthquake <laughs> is to get underneath a desk tabletop or counter. The second best thing is to just slide between the rows of chairs and get between the rows of chairs. Running is not your best option. But given lack of information, people will take what they think is the right thing. Hollywood teaches people to go stand in a doorway. Hollywood teaches people that everybody's going to panic. Really, panic seldom occurs. Hollywood teaches people, and media teaches people, that the worst comes out in people in disasters when actually the best comes out. Especially in events that happen with no warning, like earthquakes or terrorism or, or tornadoes drop down, those kind of things happen with no warning. You will see a honeymoon effect for an extended length of time where crime will drop, mental illness will drop, um, human kindness explodes and becomes prevalent. You see it, it happens. It's not as strong and as prevalent when you have warning. 
as it is when it happens without warning. But even when we saw stuff coming out of, of your area, people helping each other, you would never expect, there is the sense. And so when we teach people that in advance, they're more likely to take the actions you want them to do. If you never teach them the evacuation routes you want them to take, people will do what they think is the right thing given lack of that information. Does that help? Really, people want to know what to do. And if you don't tell them what to do, they will do what they think is the right thing. Okay. So, I would like to ask you, real quick, let's pretend that we do have a magic wand. I am the queen of my universe. Often I say that. When I'm the queen of my universe, this is what's going to happen. And I, in many ways, I am the queen of my universe. But in many ways, I'm not. So I just put the information out there so maybe somebody else will take on over bringing that up. But if you had a magic wand and you could put it over your community, what would a prepared community look like to you? Um, an evacuation plan that everyone is aware of. Okay. A network. They'd have a network. Network of what? Uh, uh, neighbors. Neighbor helping neighbor net network? Organized. They'd be organized. I heard emergency something. Emergency supplies? They'd have some emergency supplies. What else would be there? Different teams, different types of um, skill set teams. To make, you get to wave the wand. It gets to be perfect for you. Stability. They'd have stability. What does that mean? It means that they, have, they can afford seven to ten days of food in their pantry. So I'm going to say financial stability specifically. Thank you. What do you mean by that? Um, no crime, uh, uh, no criminal activity. Okay. Um, peace of mind. Oh. Okay, so there'd be they feel safe or they'd be safe. Right. Okay. So I have a couple of things that I put up here, and maybe that they fit with yours, and they, a lot of them fit with this. I think prepared community or individuals that are self-sufficient. I love the term self-sufficient versus on their own. Self-sufficient for seven to ten days. Residents would be willing to share and help each other. Community plans, has a, has, they have a communication plan that they helped create themselves and they practice regularly. Communication, if you're not going to be in the building as a management company, then the communications plan really has to come for the building, has to come from the community members because they're the ones that are going to have to talk to each other. So having them and practice. A prepared community has great partnerships between the tenants and the community. Um, they have some supplies and equipment. They've had some skills training. Some of the stuff is up here. Are you familiar with the CERT program? Community Emergency Response Training? Um, that works in some buildings and it doesn't work in others. And when it doesn't work in others, go back to the barriers. I don't have time, I don't have money, I don't know where to start. The CERT program is one day a week for six or eight weeks. If your community is working three jobs to get food on the table, given that much time is really hard. Your offices of emergency management that provide those trainings don't always understand that. So ask for something different. In my community I teach, search, I teach the CERT program but I also teach a four-hour training in disaster first aid. I have a lot more community members who can give me four hours on a Saturday that they can't give me 27 hours over six weeks. So breaking it down, and your, your offices of emergency management, your first responders who are providing this training for you may never have thought of that before. They might not think that it's possible, but it is possible. These are skills that are designed for community members to be able to do, not professional responders. Mm -hmm. And you can learn them. If you have a group of people who say, I'll give you four hours and I'll do the first aid part. No, I'll give you four hours and I'll do the search and rescue part. I'll give you four hours and I'll do the fire suppression utility control. Collectively, you have a CERT member. Then, you can, then it's more manageable. So, 
Let's break it down. What are you getting prepared for? Um, all offices of emergency management all over the country, we do what's called a hazard vulnerability analysis. It was done nationally a number of years ago and gets updated on a regular basis. They bring a group of really smart people together and they talk about all the bad, nasty things that could possibly happen to in, in the community or the state or in the country. And then they put that on the side of a spreadsheet. And then across the top, when they did it nationally, you've got a check mark besides whether you could host that kind of event. So um, New York State has identified hazards that are potential hazards and more common hazards that can happen in Washington State, or excuse me, in New York State. By the way, Washington State has the largest variety of disasters that could happen. We are the disaster du jour state, I want you to know. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? I have a great job. I get to teach people about earthquakes. Um, we can have tornadoes. We have volcanic eruption and mud flows from that. We have uh, tsunamis. We have nuclear power plants. We have Army Navy bases. We are disaster du jour. <coughs> and in your state, you have quite a few of those hazards. And then when you go to the city's website, you have even more dealing with collapsed buildings and carbon monoxide and coastal storms. And so if you went to your community members and said, okay, you got to be prepared for all of these things, what are they going to do for you? What, what, what are, do you think their response is going to be? <laughs> What's your response when I show you all of this stuff? How do you feel right now? <sighs> okay, so here's how you get through this. The most common event you will have on a regular basis is probably severe weather. Is that true? Yeah. So it is, it is a high frequency and it can be a high impact event, correct? What are some of the things that happen in one of those big weather events? What are the... Power pardon? Power outages. Power outages. What else? You can't move. No, transportation. Transportation changes. Yes. Communication fails. Okay, now let's take something that doesn't happen as frequently in New York, but will have a huge impact when it does. Let's take earthquake. When an earthquake happens, what are some of the consequences of an earthquake? Death. Well, are, is death a potential for severe weather too? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Okay. So what else is going to happen in an earthquake? Utilities go. Power outages. Utilities. Is, transportation. Infrastructure. Do you see the similarities? Fear. Yeah. Is fear going to happen in a major weather event too? Yes. Absolutely. So here's what I'm, I'm trying to coach you to. Don't focus on the event. Focus on the consequences of the event. I don't care why the power is out. It could have been a bird flying into a box that made the power grid fail in some areas. Problems the power out. Now, how does it impact you and what do you need to do? I often tell people in my programs, I, my, my goal as an educator is for all of you to be in the group that says, I'm so glad I did, than the group that says, I wish I would have before the event and during the event. So if you know you're reliant on power in order to breathe and you know power outage is going to be a problem, you can plan for it. The consequences. If I have my community plan for all of these things, and if your organization puts a binder together with a plan for every single one of these events, those binders will go on a shelf and they will become the biggest earthquake hazard you have when the earthquake happens here in New York. Because you won't remember it. But if I were to say, let's plan for the most critical consequences of a disaster. What are the consequences of not having power in your building? You already know this. You've just went through it for days. What were some of the consequences? Crime. We had a change in crime in some cases. After a, after a time frame, I know that it wasn't right away, but after a while. And oftentimes their crime is round, more around um, what do we need? Looting. They were looting. And even in, in Hurricane Katrina, we found the looting wasn't as much looting stuff as it was looting supplies they needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, truly. I mean, you saw the clips of people carrying out televisions. Yeah. But it was the same group carrying out televisions. They just rebroadcast it 100,000 times. Yeah. So, you know, power outages are going to cause problems. If we identify those problems in advance and say, let's overcome those problems, as opposed to let's deal with the disaster, you're going to be a lot more successful in how you organize.
What was most um, impacting to them in the most recent storm? Were they trapped in an upper building and they needed to get help down? That's something that's right on the front of their mind. That's going to be a consequence of not having power. Working through that is going to be one of the catalysts that will bring your community together. Deal with the consequences as opposed to the stuff. Because that's what ties in disaster, preparedness, and what does it mean to me. It's not, I, I, have to, I have to talk through the consequences of it. Because people really, when they understand the consequences, they don't want them to happen to them. And now they can understand how we can avoid some of it. And because you are so recent from a major disaster, there will be stories to tell. And those stories actually are very powerful. What are the consequences and what do they have in common? If you can kill multiple birds with one stone, please, I love birds, don't, don't get me wrong. But if you do, um, it's just so much more efficient. So, especially when you're working with communities with limited resources, instead of focusing right away on stuff and supplies, focus on plans. And the first thing I would encourage you to focus on is, excuse me, I'm going to grab the book, thank you for bringing this in, is to focus on safety. If people don't have enough resources to put together disaster supplies kits, then focus on planning. Thank you so much. Yay. We put together a little, this was one of the least expensive, most powerful little tools I think I've ever, I, it was one of my staff members, I can't take credit for this. Tracy Conley is who pulled this together, Disaster Resource Book. We did it the first time and then we redid it using more graphics because we found a lot of our community members are not literate in their language, so using graphics is more powerful. The book does not focus on stuff, it focuses on what do I have to do when it happens because sometimes that's all the time they have to deal with is when it happens. So we ask, if you see a fire, what do you do? The first thing to think about after a disaster is, are you okay? And then work from there. And this um, resource book, we, we found a vendor that sells the little photo album things for under a buck and it takes 50 cents or so to print the cards. Mm -hmm. So for a, under two dollars we have something that we say if people cannot get themselves, if they don't have enough stuff, enough money and, and resources for stuff or space, at least do the book. And the program that Tracy teaches with this, during the program she gives two minutes every now and then as they're walking through the book. Would you complete this part for me? What is your communications plan? Where would you meet up with your family? And so within the class, our goal, and whenever we teach a program is, I'm going to step off camera for just a sec. Um, our goal is people give us time to be there. They should be better prepared for having just visited us. So I, that's one of the things I really love to do. But talk about safety actions first, things that might happen more frequently. What do I do if I smell smoke in the building? And, and look at it from their perspective. How, what do they need to know? Where are all the manual pow, uh, stations? These are basic stuff that not everybody, we take for granted that a lot of people should know this already, but I'm learning that's not the case. We had a major storm. Actually, uh, Muhammad Ali was the community member who won a national award at the same award ceremony that I was at. We had a major storm in 2006 where we had an epidemic of carbon monoxide poisoning and we lost nine people, I believe. Eight people were killed and we had over 200 people admitted into hospitals and we people and it was mostly the Somali community who was not given the information when they came to the community about carbon monoxide poisoning and power went out for several days and their history and their life experience when the power goes out you start cooking inside it's not a big deal but that's not the case in our country so we lost eight people and we had 200 people exposed to carbon monoxide that were hospitalized, an epidemic. They did a community a grassroots education program. We created information pictorially, which if you want that, we'd be happy to provide it for you as well. It's translated into 14 languages and it's pictorial in each language. The next time we had a major power outage, we had no fatalities and 98% drop in number of people who went to the hospital. So it's amazing when we can educate it that way and we can use our community leaders, it makes all the difference in the world. But what do I do when that's practical for them is so very, very important. Practical for them. Not necessarily what we on government think they should be. It's called makeitthrough.org because we found that people want to survive. And so it's survivors telling stories.
of what they did and what worked and what they didn't do and what they wish they would have. And we have survivors from hurricanes, we have survivors from earthquakes, um, and it, it just helps round out. It, it really, we found people want to survive and they want to get the information from survivors. So you have people who survived a major storm and some of them survived it better than others. Having them tell their story is why they did that, why they survived better and what they wish they would have is a very, very powerful message. It may not be the message, you may want to get survivor stories from a building from somewhere else in the city so it's not your own residents telling the story to their own residents. That might be more powerful. You need to figure that out from your community but survivor stories are very, very powerful. They will motivate people to take action when nothing else does. It's survivor stories from people they feel trusted, they trust. How do you get information and what do I do? People need to hear information at least seven times before they recognize it exists. This is marketing strategies. So if I'm going to buy Coca-Cola, they know they have to hit me with some kind of advertising at least seven times before I even recognize the red can. Then I need to hear about Coca-Cola from three sources that I deem credible. And that's mostly somebody who looks like me and is, and um, somebody I recognize that's a celebrity or some, somebody I trust. And then I might go buy a Coke. So your disaster information has to be something similar along those lines. People, the, the major corporations spend billions of dollars motivating us to do an action. We need to kind of take the same philosophies. Your information needs to be available at least seven times before they recognize it exists. That evacuation sign is one. Now, how else are they going to get it seven times? They're going to hear it, they're going to see it, they need to have somebody tell them. Those are all seven times before they go, oh, you, you, you're talking to me. Oh, I get it, it's for me. And then the trusted source is a survivor or somebody within the community that they deem credible. And we also learned this from um, hurricane studying in Florida decades ago. They found that the three sources, if they heard to evacuate three times, when you hear the word, the, the, uh, the order to evacuate, I guarantee you, you will channel surf. You will want to hear it from at least three other sources before you go, oh, I need to leave, and it means they're talking to me. Three other sources. So that's one of the things we've been working with media is trying to get consistent information so that when they do channel surf, they get the same information. There's a major storm coming, you need to evacuate, here's your evacuation routes. We're still working on that because it's hard to control the media. It's like herding cats sometimes. I, I, somebody once said, um, you, the media, they're a lot like alligators. You don't have to like them, but you do have to feed them. And, and so we do have to give them good information. Where do I get my information from? And what really com they're concerned about, how am I going to connect with my family and friends? So helping your, it's really planning more so. Helping them create good plans as opposed to talking about stuff is so much more powerful. And then we can talk about stuff later. So there are three ways <coughs> which we encourage people to prepare. And I'm going to be right up front. These are not the national messages. Um, this is from our research in Seattle um, for the what to do to make it through campaign. We did focus groups um, and we did a very diverse set of focus groups. We did it in three different languages. We did it with urban and rural and age in mind. Um, we did it with economics in mind. Um, we did it with um, the people with functional needs. We just, we had as big a base as we could. And we found that seven to ten days was what they're willing to prepare for. That three days, the attitude, if it's only three days I can get by. Seven to ten I will do. When you ask them how long should they prepare for in a catastrophic event, they all came up with longer than seven to ten days. But they came back and said, but if you ask me to do more than seven to ten days, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> And a lot of them jumped off into that fourth phase of denial. Well, we're all going to be dead anyway, so why should I prepare? So we found seven to ten days is a Goldilocks time. And especially when you're talking about supplies, that's a lot harder. And I get that. So talk more about planning. And then we'd be creative about supplies. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So make a plan comes first. Build a kit. A lot of people they just like the checkbox. They just like to be able to say, I've got something. So build a kit is high up there. But the third one, and nationally, it is um, build a kit, make a plan, be informed. We found be informed didn't make any sense, really. But help each other does. 
It translates into every language we ask, it, ask our community members about. Help each other is at the core. I mean, if we really wanted to put these in the right order, help each other would be coming first. But planning is so very important. That's what's first, then supplies, and then be ready to help each other. So let's talk a little bit about that. If you haven't gotten yourself ready for a disaster, this is where I want you to start thinking about this personally as well as within your organization. Stay off all phones for at least three to five hours. I don't care whether it's a cell phone, a landline phone, doesn't matter what it is. If you're safe and you can get by just helping each other, stay off all the phones. Because the phone call that you may try to make might be the one that your family member might have tried to make to get to 911 because they need desperate help. So only call if you have life-threatening emergency. After some time, and I can't really put a day on it, but when communications start coming back up, actually landlines have a higher priority. Long distance landlines will be re more restored more frequently first than local lines. There's a little bit of shift going in that because 65% of people are now using cell phone technology as opposed to landline te technology. But still, a landline phone, knowing who in your community, your building, and, and around you still has landline phones is a really good thing to do because they're more reliable. Not, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the terminology payphone. The most reliable phones is our payphones. My sister in Flagstaff, Arizona, it's through my sister in Flagstaff that I'll find out how my brother is in, the, in, in Washington State because we triangulate. In, we triangulate all the time. It's just not always healthy, but in a disaster situation, that triangulation is healthy, yes. Um, we've also found in Boston and also in Superstorm Sandy that Facebook was really helpful if you could get to uh, a computer system and you could use it. Facebook to tell people you were okay was very strong. And in Boston, especially in the bombing in Boston during the marathon, that was a very strong way in which people communicated. That's how they reuni reunified at different places around the city if they couldn't get back in touch with each other is through Facebook on their phones. And text messaging is the best. Um, but there are some things you need to know about texting. I would encourage you to make a group, if you text, make a group of the most important people. So once the event has happened, you can pull up the group, you can say, I'm okay, hit the send button, and then start helping people. Now what happens with that, though, you need to understand, is that the whole, once you hit send, your phone is looking for a cell tower, and it's using your battery to do that. And it, once it gets to a cell tower, it'll take it, it'll grab that information, and it puts it up into the cell system. And when it has time, it bursts it out. That's why it's so reliable. It keeps you to 144 characters, and it does it as it has space. So once you hit send, you can go start helping people and, and taking care of yourself and others around you. Not everybody has text, and not everybody know. My thumbs are really big. I don't text really well. And I work with a lot of seniors in communities that just this is just technology they don't want to learn. But you could buddy them up with somebody who does. Give them a buddy who's nine years old. They can work any phone. It's true. <laughs> buddy them up. And it's a way to build relationships. It's, it's, yeah. When the communications plan in your building, would you please start, please, please, please start with the three Ps. Paper, pencil, and people. Paper, pencil, and people. Technology, if you base your communication on technology, it will mess up every time. But if you base it on paper, pencil, people, you're more likely to have a structure for a longer period of time without technology. So one of the things we did in Seattle is we created a simple communication, one of the cheapest communication tools I've ever made. I would love to say this was my idea, but I steal ideas from everywhere. So you can steal this. All you have to do is talk about it three times and it's yours. So it's been 3,000 times I've done this. What we did, this is a communication tool for community members to talk to each other. It's not for professional responders. My professional responders don't even know that sign exists. But if after the event, you're okay, you put the okay sign in your window and it signals to your neighbors you're okay. If you need help, you put the help sign. It signals to your neighbors you need help. If you are in a residential, uh, a vertical community instead of horizontal, we made it in a door sign. It's a little more expensive because of the cutout, but it's less expensive in a way because of the size. But help and okay, we don't, we don't translate this because we found that help and okay is pretty easily understood in all languages. And it doesn't take much for community members to help us teach this. Help if you need help, okay if you don't. Paper, pencil, and people. If you leave your 
apartment, your building, your residence, your home, and you're going somewhere else, you put the OK sign in the window so people don't worry that there's a problem in your unit. It saves time and energy. It's, it's the simplest thing I've ever done. And I'll provide the camera ready art to Lori. I already talked to her about that. So you guys can use that. Paper, pencil, and people. You, you would do a great service to your community if you just create places to put bulletin boards up. We learned this in Katrina. And we do this here in, C in our area in Seattle. We have communication hubs staffed and created by community members. They've come up with a way in which they feel that they can help neighbors communicate with each other. Now, one of the things you said here um, on this um, ideal community is that they would be neighbor-based resource center. Our hubs are where they share uh, if, if a community needs first aid and first aid supplies, they bring the note to the board. And if another part of the community is doing well and they have first aid supplies, they go help. So it's a way of bringing together, I need help with I have resources within the community for that seven to 10 days before professional responders can come. Does that make sense? Yes? Actually, it makes a lot of sense to me. I remember about 10 years ago going to um, Club Med and um, there was a storm in uh, New York and I actually couldn't get home but didn't know it and I went to the board. Actually, someone on the island said to me, hey, you have a message on the board and I went to the board to only see notes from my mother, my job. Everything. Wow. It does work. I have um, a three child care providers that are within, um, they're around the University of Washington and they have designated a spot that they will go to and put post-it notes on if any one of the three need help from the other, one of the other two. And so it's, it's paper, pencil, people. Then you add your technology, and that could be walkie-talkies, it could be uh, um, push to talk, it could be lots of things, but add your technology after that. You should talk about with your family, where would you meet up? If you couldn't get all the way home, where would you meet up? Who would you connect with? And in our area, and your area too, you have a lot of bridges and waterways, and you might not be able to get where you need to go very easily. So if you had to stay, where would you stay? And how, how work that, that out in advance. Um, by the way, if you haven't seen the video, it's on YouTube, Boat Lift. I highly recommend it. Um, I just saw this recently, um, and it was about the evacuation uh, on 9-11 via waterway. And I, 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 I'm surprised. Um, it was the largest maritime evacuation in the history of the world. And this is a documentary about it. Tom Hanks narrates it. It is so powerful. 500,000 people were evacuated in less than nine hours by water that day. And it's just, it's very powerful. It's about people taking initiative and just doing what they need, knew needed to get done. Highly recommend it. Creating your plan about expectations and realities. It, I really believe you ought to be honest with your group. And if you don't know when the power is gonna come back up, then say you don't know when the power is gonna come back up. If you don't know when things are gonna happen, say you just don't know. And then when you say, this is what I've heard, this is what I've heard. I don't know that this is true, but this is what I've heard and this is where I heard it. So just be really, really clear with the expectations. Let them know right now, right up front, the likelihood of professional responders in a major disaster, catastrophic event being there right away is zero. And reality is, if the pro professional responders are at your building, it's because you are the hardest hit. You don't want them there, really, because that means you're doing better than other places. So, and if, if they need to know building management's gonna be delayed, let them know right up front, because then they can start planning on how would they be able to take care of themselves. So, overcoming the consequences for your health and well-being every day, you need about a half a gallon of liquids. But if you were trapped on the ocean, in a raft boat, in a raft, and the Coast Guard provided you resources in the, in the raft, life raft, they'd give you about eight ounces a day. So most water bottle you buy in a vending is about 16 ounces. I'd say one of those per day would get you by. Not healthy, not ideal, but would get you by. Is that a lot more manageable for you? You know, if you bought a half a case of water when it was on sale for $1.99 and you put it in your front hall closet, could you do that? Would you do that tonight if you haven't? Please, on your way home? Do it, start it with something. 
Water. Radio and batteries comes next because you're going to crave information and it's through AM, FM radio you're more likely to get information. So we did a great program with our police foundation who bought, helped us buy crank radios and crank flashlights. They don't take batteries. So we could give to our community members in our, in our um, um, Seattle Housing Authority buildings. So that at least one on every floor they had a place to crank, get radio information and it created kind of a communications hub for them. Uh, flashlights and glow sticks. People who live in urban environments have no idea how dark dark is until the power goes out. Power grid. Not just power, but power grid. Dark is dark. You will do a great service by just having snap lights. You know what I'm talking about, glow sticks? They have a five to seven year shelf life. You can buy them by the case for a buck or less. At Halloween time, they're even more prevalent. And right after Halloween, they're a lot cheaper in the, in the stores. A, a glow stick and duct tape is a way to create emergency lighting if you had to. How much does emergency lighting cost to install in your building? A lot of money. And it only lasts for a certain amount of time because you have to have power for it, right? So the batteries run out, now you have dark hallways. Your backup, it can't be your, it can't be your only source of light because that's not building code. But in a disaster situation, duct taping some glow sticks at every level and putting it down the stairwell, whew, voila. Yeah, it works. Prescription medication. Oh, by the way, notice I didn't say candles and open flame. The United States, we have the highest fire fatality of any country in the industrialized world on a daily basis. We don't do well with fire every day. So what are we going to say? Yeah, just build a couple fires and use some candles for light in a disaster. When there's no fire department to help you, there's no water source to put out fire. Ugh, bad idea. So candles and open flame, no. Flashlights and glow sticks, more positive. Um, prescription meds, we lost a lot of people Hurricane Katrina and Rita simply because they ran out of their medication. So if you could encourage people to work with their doctors and their pharmacists to find out how they would start gathering a little extra supply of the medications they need. When I'm the queen of my universe, when somebody is diagnosed with diabetes, they will get the disaster information right then on how to keep it cold, how to modify their food, how to add exercise if they had to, how would they do that? When I'm the queen of my universe, that will happen. But in the meantime, help educate people on ways in which they can work with their doctor and their pharmacist to determine how can they have some extra supply of their meds. Food, I put that really low on the list because realistically we can get by longer without food than we think we can. But we'll be really grumpy and irritable. <laughs> so my rule of thumb is if you don't like tuna fish now, you're not going to like it after an earthquake either. I don't care if it comes in a foil pouch and you don't have to drain it anymore. If you're a vegetarian, having meat in your disaster supplies kit doesn't make sense. Pick the food you like to eat that you eat on a regular basis that you would normally pull off the shelf and use as opposed to something like meals ready to eat. Because meals ready to eat are really the desperate eating source. They're not very good. Pick the food you like to eat. <laughs> if you don't like to, in, to change out your food, Twinkies still have a 20-year shelf life. And I think somebody else has picked that up to make them now, so do it. Glasses, if you're prescription re reliant for glasses, when you get your prescription filled, put your old glasses in your disaster supplies kit so you're only one prescription away if something were to happen. Some comfy clothes and sturdy shoes. I can do a little bit of this in a backpack and put it at my desk, underneath my desk, which is what I do. Um, I have supplies and a suitcase on wheels. As a matter of fact, my partner and I are moving, and she found how many of those disaster supplies kits? Gosh, four. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Five gallon containers of water that I empty and refill. She says, another container of water? You never know, dear, when you're going to need it. <laughs> I like putting it in a suitcase on wheels because it's, it's easy to get out the door, easy to roll. Um, I like front hall closets, but if you don't have a front hall closet, some options for you. I had somebody who lives in a really efficient studio apartment. She had a basket for a coffee table. In the basket was her disaster supplies kit. So you can be creative. You can put things underneath the, the bed and roll away bag. There's all sorts of ways you can do this. Just be creative. After the, oh, some, some things around the house, and that actually, the little resource book I handed around, that does have some things, ideas on this. Paper and pencil, marking pens, those kind of things around the house. Put them in your, you already have them, put them in your kit. Um, you will be surprised what you can barter for, for um, with a roll of toilet paper. An extra roll of toilet paper might get you an extra bottle of water, you never know. So think of what you can share as well. Garbage bags make great shelter. They also collect rainwater. They can be a poncho. They could be a toilet. There's all sorts of things that black plastic bar garbage bags can be. So think about what else you could use and how you'd be resourceful. I, I just put this in, in, the, in the, this, I've never used this before. Remember, 
oh, there's actually animation here. So if there was animation, you'd actually see the slide before this. And before that is when she is looking, you recognize this, Gone with the Wind? Okay. She is needing a dress so that she can save Tara. She's going to go to Red and she's going to be asking for money and she needs to look good. And she hasn't got anything because it's all been destroyed in the war. And she looks at the curtains and she sees these beautiful draperies and she makes them into this gorgeous dress. That's resourcefulness. <laughs> if your community members don't have a blanket, curtains can become a blanket. Your shower curtain can become shelter in the, in, in the rain. I mean, there are ways in which we can teach people how to be resourceful. And people with limited resources are far more resourceful than people that have resources. I have to talk to people very differently in a community that has, has resources. It's like, I don't know how we're going to, how can we possibly answer? Well, the first thing you have to eat in a power outage, what's the first thing you're going to have to consume before, before it goes bad in a power outage situation? Yeah. Refrigerator stuff, right? Yeah. So there's your first potluck. <laughs> what goes next after several days? Your freezer. There's your next barbecue. <laughs> I mean, it's a way in which you build community. Use your resources. And we can do this. And the third thing about uh, overcoming consequences is getting down to the brass tacks. I might be individually prepared for seven to ten days, but if I prepare with my community, I'm prepared for seven months. Collectively, we just, the, the X factor exponentially changes when we do this together. It makes a huge difference. Help each other is natural for most people truly is. And by letting your community know the best source of help is not going to be professional responders, it's not going to be building managers, it's going to be your neighbors. And they're going to stomp, some of them are going to stomp their foot at you. I don't like my neighbors, I don't know my neighbors, they don't speak my language, they don't look like me, all of these things. But yet preparing can be a catalyst to make that change. Especially if we know in advance we're going to need each other. But let's not just make it neighbors. In your office, it's your coworkers. In your place of worship, if that's when the disaster happens, it's those that are around you. It's those that are around us that help us build resilient. We're, all over the country, we're trying to define what is a resilient community. Bottom line is, it's people coming together to help each other, spontaneously and organized. It's just people helping people. That's resiliency. So when you're planning and trying to build these relationships, there are barriers. Step over those barriers. Look beyond them. Say, there are language barriers. Okay, how can you help overcome the language barriers in your building? Talk to me. How can you do it? Talk to me. How can you do it? Learn common, common, common terminology. Right. Who's going to be your trusted source? The community members that speak the language. Who often are bilingual? The kids. The kids. Kids need to be just as empowered as adults do. Empowering your kids to help be your translators is a huge gift. One of the award winners at Nationally was, um, he was from Chinatown. And his kids, he had kids that had developed the materials and translated and delivered to the seniors in Chinatown. And they were awesome and proud. He brought two of them with him to Washington, D.C. It was like they were just so stoked. Overcome this. You can do that. The trust issues, the physical limitations. Um, I know that some of your buildings may have more turnover than others, and so incorporate this information right as you get a new tenant. There should be a packet that includes the disaster information. There's their first glimpse at it, out of seven. And then you can start talking about it, and community members talk about it. Remember, they need to see it seven times before they go, oh, you mean me? Other ways you can help. Um, Any time that you have an opportunity to be in front of a set of eyes, take advantage of it. So at your staff meetings, if your staff are responsible for safety actions like checking the buildings, um, then take a moment. Have you ever heard of stand-up meetings? Stand-up meetings are a meeting that you have with your team that's a very focused topic and it never lasts more than five minutes because you can't sit down. It's a really good way to go through safety actions. So if I were to talk with my team about earthquake safety, I would have them stand up, gather around and say, okay, the earthquake has just happened or is happening right now. It starts to shake. What are you going to do? And we'd go around the room and say, we drop cover and hold. I'd be here. I'd be here. I'd be here. Okay, the ground stops shaking. What's the most important things for us to do to activate the emergency operations center? We'd check off the top five things and we would just say it around the room to each other. See it, say it, do it makes a huge difference as to whether you remember it or not. 
So have it be something that you can see, say, and do, and you re reiterate it on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, I'm going to give you one to do. Would you stand up? The brain can only absorb what the derriere can endure, so stand up. <laughs> I'm going to take you through a little step-by-step -step that I do. You're going to need your hands free. Set your hands down. Not your hands down, but the stuff in your hands down. <laughs> All right, shake it out. It's going to be a lot of work for you. All right. So I'm gonna, when we talk to our community members, we know we only get them for 45 minutes, tops. And then I may never see them again. So they have to remember the most important things from the moment I leave until it happens, which could be a year or two from then. So the most important, I think this works for any kind of community in any disaster. You check yourself, your family, your home, your neighbors, your neighborhood. So do that with me. You check yourself your family, your home, your neighbors, your neighborhood. Now, this time I want you to say it with me and use your hands. You check yourself, your family, your home, your neighbors, your neighborhood. Do it again. You check yourself, your family, your home, your neighbors, your neighborhood. Yeah. So when the major disaster happens, this gray-haired lady is going to flash right before your eyes. So how's my hair? <laughs> Splash right before you. You're going to say, what's the most important thing to do? What's the most important thing for you to do in a disaster situation? So. What's next? Family. Family or those around you. Then what? Home, Home or your environment you're in. Next? Neighbors. Neighbors. You could just do that. Start every community group. When you're talking about safety, have them stand up and do check yourself, your family, your home, your neighbor's neighborhood. You'd be surprised what they're going to remember from that. But the reason why I do it more than anything is the kinesthetic learning. Using your muscle memory to remember that will help you do that when you have a gallon and a half of adrenaline running through your body. I have used this phrase for decades, capture, engage with. It's capturing the teachable moment. Teachable moment doesn't have to be here in your community. The teachable moment can happen in Seattle. Our biggest teachable moment in my career, decades career, was the earthquake that happened in Japan with the tsunami that followed it. I had more requests for information and um, programs after that than I have ever had in my career. We sent out 60,000 pieces of literature that requests by mail, phone calls, emails, requests. That didn't include what people downloaded on their own. We taught 13,000 people in less than a year with the three of us and a couple of extra people. It was a teachable moment I have never had. And, and, and have, had not had again till Superstorm Sandy. Superstorm Sandy was my teachable moment in Seattle. We were looking here and saying, what's the difference? What are people doing? How are people getting by? What are the lessons learned? And the community was calling us and saying, that could happen here, it could happen to us, I'm ready to get the information, what do you want me to do? We have started the CERT program in Seattle. We have a very limited staff. We teach it twice a year. My classes fill in 90 minutes, literally. I reserve spaces because all of us should be asking who's not calling. We should ask that question more frequently than who is calling, who's not calling. We reserve spaces to work with our community members, to get community members in that would not necessarily take it. Our most common event is severe weather. Our biggest event is earthquake. So before I leave, I say, okay, the earthquakes just happened. What do you do? Check yourself, your family, your home, your neighbors, your neighborhood. When you go outside, what do you do? Before you go out, you put your okay sign in the window. When you get to your meeting spot, what's the three most important things to do? Control utilities, check on each other, do first aid. If I can just get them to remember those things when that, so I can be the gray-haired lady that flashes in front of their eyes, somebody in the group will remember those things. I have some neighborhoods that are really, really organized together. They're very cohesive. They like to plan parties together. They do holiday parties. They do picnics and barbecues. They do all sorts of things together. They're the group that's going to have teams to do those kind of things. And I have some neighborhoods that are so into this, they have matching hard hats and gloves and goggles and dust masks and they have team names and cheers. I mean, it's just, it's almost sickening. But they, they're, they're so well prepared. They love it. It's one of the synergies for their community. And I have others that are working two and three jobs to put food on the table. They don't have time for that. They're the respond on the fly group. And I celebrate just as much with the respond on the fly as I do the well organized. 
because Respond on the Fly will get it done as well. They know what they're supposed to do, where they're supposed to go, and what's the highest priorities. When they get there, they'll decide. The three of you go start checking this side of the building. You guys go start checking this side of the building for utilities. You guys, can you start setting up first aid right now? They'll do it on the day of if they remember what they're supposed to do. And that's that reiteration, picking up simple stuff, reiterating it over and over again, reminding them. Keep it basic, keep it simple. Our program is called SNAP, Seattle Neighborhoods Actively Prepare. There are lots of neighborhood programs out there. Ours is not the best, it's not the worst, it works for us. It's not gonna work for you, but pieces of it might. So clone it in whatever you need to do. And all of our stuff is out on our website, seattle.gov forward slash emergency or Google SNAP in Seattle and you'll find it. Um, we have job descriptions and checklists and maps you can organize your neighborhood with, all sorts of stuff. But so does Map Your Neighborhood, which is Washington State. You have All Together Now, which is a New York program. You have the CERT program. There's all sorts of programs out there. We've been working hard for decades to create just the right Goldilocks fit for you. And I can tell you it's not out there. You just need to fix, grab what works for you. Have your community members help grab what works for you. And you'll find that it's really more successful. If you think you're inventing a wheel, stop. The bicycle's there. Adjust the handlebars and the seat, put a little air in the tire, go a different direction. Mm -hmm. Just stop. I get really tired of people just saying, oh, we need to have all this money to start this whole brand new program all over again. Eh, not really. But you might need some funding to help make it effective for you. I don't have the SNAP program translated into all my 19 languages. You might specifically need it in a set of languages and you might only need a couple of job descriptions or checklists. Use it, ad adjust it, adapt it. It's far more effective. And a couple of creations for, how am I doing on time? Okay, okay. So some ideas that we've done for success. Look for, in places that you wouldn't normally look for partners. So for example, um, the Police Foundation. Seattle Police Foundation has um, um, a request for projects uh, three times a year. And every time I've done this, I've been successful. I go to the Police Foundation and I say, I want to work with my Seattle Housing um, Authority buildings. These are the three buildings I want to work with. Or I want to work with the senior community. These are the groups I want to work with. I want to give them education and I'd like for them to all have a crank radio or a crank flashlight because it's important, it's a value for the fire, or the fire department and the police department for the community members to know the information. They need a radio and they can't afford it. So we'll provide the programs and all the materials and we'll take it right to them. Will you help us provide the crank radios? I've been given uh, three, 4,000 crank radios now funding for it, for programs. And some buildings, they get one per floor. Other buildings, they get one per person, depending on the program. But it's a way, I would have never thought the Police Foundation would be willing to do that. But they are, they have a vested interest and they get great billing on my program saying this is, as, you know, support your Police Foundation. This is a great way to do that. Target has given us $10,000 every September for the last three years to help outreach to families that need a little help. So we do a program they get a little bit of disaster supplies kit and then they get a shopping card. And the first year we did it, they got a shopping card for $50 and they got to shop with a cop. We brought our police officers from the precinct in and they got to go around and the cops, the police officers helped them make good decisions like space blankets and, and kind of food they might consider and water and first aid supplies. It helped me educate my police officers. It was a wonderful win-win. Um, our Department of Neighborhoods has matching fund awards. Uh, they are not grants, they are matching fund awards. And I'd encourage you to go out to Seattle Department of Neighborhoods because I think they're very innovative with this. Um, they have a small Sparks Award that's $1,000 or less, has so little paperwork in it that anybody can accomplish because those are your barriers, remember? I don't have time, I don't have money, I don't know where to start. So $1,000 or less has very little paperwork at all. But with that $1,000, you, you have to match it. You match it with either donated goods, so they go to Starbucks or someplace local and get food, that's part of the donation match. They can um, have some supplies donated for their building, that can work as part of the match. Um, but they value people's time at $20 an hour. So if you got 10 people in at $20 an hour and you had an hour presentation, that's a huge part of your match. And $1,000 goes a long way in a building for creating a place, a just just first aid supplies. 
enough, an, a, a good start for that. Uh, maybe that gets, uh, we've had some that have gotten some, two walkie talkies. So they could have a walkie talkie in the top of the building and one in the bottom and then they use that as the focal point or one in the middle and one at the bottom. So, um, and then they also have a, a matching fund award that can go up to $20,000. And we've had um, community, now they have to match it and they have to have a, an agent who can manage the money for them. But we've had some great success. They don't always ask for, you know, they might ask $10,000, but that might provide first aid training for community members who would not be able to do it and to take it. And then think about the skill you've given them that might help them in getting a new job. Just because they have CPR and first aid training, it might change their whole life. And, yet you, and then the other part of it goes for first aid supplies. So look in places you wouldn't always think about. And then I, I, I have given you what I call, I've given you so much information, this is where you get paralysis by analysis. This is the worst thing an educator can do, is spend 90 minutes dumping information on you and then say, okay, bye-bye. Mm -hmm. When really, I'm, I've given you so much, I've given you a little bit of overwhelm. So would you look at your notes in your bright idea page for me? Look at them. Did something touch your heart where you went, oh man, I need to tell my mom or my dad that, or I need to bring this up in my community? That's a great idea. I hadn't thought about ta doing a stand-up meeting. There was something there that kind of you kind of went, aha, the light bulb went off. Would you circle it, please? And if you didn't have anything there, would you make the pretend circle anyway? It makes me feel better from an educator's perspective. And then could you please give, if, if you would be willing, would you turn to the person next to you and tell them one thing that you learned today that made a difference? Just one thing. Turn the person next to you. Let's talk to somebody. Should we got something connected? Yay! Would any of you be willing to share what you what you said? What was one thing that was really valuable for today? Yes, sir. Glow sticks. Glow sticks. I love glow sticks. Yes. Oh, no. you're, you're in for the glow sticks. Yeah. Prepare. Preparedness. Preparedness. Yes. Yes, and awareness. What else? Uh, for me, that laundry bag, it doesn't take a lot of things. It's light. You can put it in your go kit, which is not sad. It was good. Go it's simple. simple. It's yes. simple. Keep mm -hmm. it simple. Yes. What else? Water and um, like uh, gloves, you know, sanitation gloves. Yeah. You know, you can use um, Ziploc bags for gloves and protection if you had to. Yeah. If you don't have gloves, how do you make do? Glo gloves are important to protect yourself and whoever you're working on. What else would you do? Yes? The uh, graphic cards. The helpful K things? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's yes. Oh, the flip up books. Things. Yeah, the books. Oh, you like the resource book? <laughs> yeah. Where did that resource book end up? Yes. Also, I would add on to those uh, OK and help. Yeah. If somebody has a mobility problem, put like a wheelchair on it. Mm -hmm. So that that is also easily um, identified. That's a great idea. Uh, and also, I like I have never thought about seeking funding because I talk about CPR training all the time, mm -hmm. but I never thought about seeking funding so that people can afford CPR training. I think that that's a good um, give them the skills. They'll do it. They'll do it. Yeah. I like the term self-sufficient. Self-sufficient is so much more. I'm just bathing in this. I love this. Thank you. One more. Yes. Um, I, oh, you were going to say something. Um, to piggyback up with what she was saying is maybe add stickers. So if you are hearing impaired, you won't hear a knock on the door. Add a sticker to it. Yeah. But what I really enjoyed is um, the 7 to 10 days goes to 7 to 10 months if you're willing to prepare with your community. Yeah. I, I'm taking back far more than I could ever expect that I've given you. So thank you so much. Thank you for sh sharing and for being here and for taking just one little snippet back to somebody you care about and sharing that. I appreciate it. Thank you so much.